Hello, good morning. How are you? It's quite a fresh autumnal morning. Slow way or fast way? Slow way or fast way? We'll do the slow way. I just put the windows down so I can emerge. Sans issue. It's going to be a bit of a bright day today. Sorry about all the sun effects. Anyway, I hope you're well. Hope things are going well. Your surgery's going well. We. I uh, left my. I pumped up the tyres in the car, and I got one of those things that pumps into the plugs into the cigarette lighter and then I left the ignition switched on overnight and got a flat battery so I haven't been in the car been on my scooter so the scooter only had a left turn signal not a right turn signal so I had to go to work the other way which is all left turns so but I find I fixed that at the weekend so now I've got a scooter with two turn signals on it so I can go to work either way this is the all right turns way doesn't matter in this car because obviously the indicators are working. So, whoa. Hello, Mr. Gotham and son. I don't mind if those lorries have got to get down here because of access, but they don't. There are other longer ways of getting from the top of this road to the bottom. But, um, That's the one of the blindest corners on the on the whole road, so trust me to meet him there. Fortunately I've only got a little tiddly car, it's very narrow. So what's up, what's up? Is it uh, Are you worried about paying your mortgage? I doubt it. I had a mortgage. I qualified uh, I was uh, 23 when I qualified as a dentist and I took out a 25 year mortgage which expired when I was 48, which uh, not to put too fine a point on it was 15 years ago. But then I bought a larger house and got another 25 year mortgage to um, slow down cowboy to uh, co coincide with me turning 65 in a couple of years. So I've still got a couple of years to go on the mortgage but it's not, you know, we borrowed about three or four hundred and now it's down to about 70 and I was going to say most of the uh, payments going back on uh, capital now but I suppose there might not be more well, you think well you could have gone I would have let you go sorry about the rattle I'll have to find out what that is I think it's a uh, my uh, spare tyre supposed to be fastened with a bit of studding with a nut on it, but the uh, studding's all mucked up. No! Road closed! This is terrible. I've got to make a quick phone call. Hang on. Og. I uh, had to ring my future son-in-law and tell him that uh, the road's shut. Only to find out that he'd already been up the road and found out it was shut and he hadn't rung me. Ah. So let's talk a bit about the economy and what's, what's going well and what's going badly. Because according to the press, it's all doom and gloom. So, and also how, you know, as, a, as the owner of a, as the owner operator of a dental practice, how you might want to think about it and how uh, you might need to react. So, let's just do a quick uh, prologue. Um, but the uh, Bank of England is in charge of uh, the amount of money that's in the economy and is tasked with a job of broadly matching the amount of money to the amount of uh, economic activity. And the way to think about this is, say, the price of a loaf of bread, for example, or a pint of milk. Uh, what they're doing is they're looking at the number of uh, people, how hard they're working, 
and how many loaves of bread there are and how many pints of milk there are. And they try and keep the money, the amount of money around, uh, roughly uh, so that the price of bread and milk stays the same. Yeah? So bear with me. So if there's too much money, and then loads of people have got money, they're going to start buying bread and the price of bread's going to go up because there'll be more money chasing the same amount of bread. And, all, and also, if there's less bread, then they have to cut the amount of money down because otherwise, uh, they, uh, sorry, they uh, have to um, increase the amount of money because, again, you'll have the uh, same amount of money chasing less bread and so the price of bread will go up. So if you, if you broadly accept that the idea of the Bank of England is to match the amount of money to how hard people are working and uh, what they've got to buy. So the prices stay stable, and that was their mandate, price stability. Uh, in fact, they had a mandate of a 2% inflation rate, because um, we won't go into that because that's a whole other podcast, uh, but basically that's, um... oh, I was just thinking, this is a new route for you. You haven't seen this one before, have you? This is the Grove Ferry route, because there's a, there was a ferry up here replaced by a bridge. Anyway, um, so yeah, they've got a 2% inflation because the, the government likes to print money and uh, uh, inflation is a tax on everybody who has got any money or a wage or a savings or a pension or anything. And so what happens is you see the value, the purchasing power of your pound going down by 2% a year and the government then steals that and spends it. So. And that's a normal course of events, right? But what happens is when the uh, amount of money gets out of control, especially when the supply of goods and services dries up, and there you get two problems. You get like an um, increase in the money supply and a supply shock, a supply shock of goods and services. And then you get high inflation, and that's precisely what we've got. Now, the money supply, uh, the way that the... Um, Bank of England increases the money supply, basically, is that the Treasury writes the Bank of England an IOU, so it's saved for, I don't know, 50 billion, and offer to pay uh, 4%, or whatever, 3%, and then the Bank of England says, thanks very much, I'll stick your IOU in the drawer, and I'll give you your 5 billion or whatever, and uh, have fun. So, that is, that is ultimately it. The IOU is called a bond, and it's uh, repayable by the government after a certain period, and it pays a fixed interest rate. Now, cut a long story short, the government has gone completely bonkers writing IOUs because the uh, there's always an excuse. There's always an excuse to write an IOU. And there's a nice view of Kent for you. If it wasn't for those bloody pylons going right across the landscape, Constable will be turning in his grave. So, you know, first of all, it's like, oh yeah, no, we need to spend on social entitlements, health entitlements. Uh, infrastructure, HS2, and then along comes COVID, and oh yeah, well we've already we've already created and spent a load of money, but now's not the time to worry about that. Let's spend now and worry about what we're going to do about it later. And uh, and then uh, uh, war in uh, Ukraine, energy prices go through the roof. People need support with their energy prices, their energy bills. Um, and so what happens is these people who are trading in government bonds, and it's not just the Treasury, uh, it's not just the Bank of England that buys them. It's, uh, you know, they're, they're liquid, they're bought and sold in, you know, all over the world. <coughs> Basically, they're an IOU. They're just, it's the same as having a five billion pound note except that it pays interest as opposed to your five pound note in your pocket. So, people are starting to say, well, you know, you're, you're printing an awful lot of these things, 
and uh, so I'm going to need a bit more interest uh, because I think that there's so many of these chasing uh, goods and services now that they're not worth you know they're not buying so much so I need a bit more infl uh, a bit more interest and so the um, the government is having to increasingly pay more um, interest on its on its uh, borrowings and this is a problem because uh, when they refinance let's say they've got a five billion pound IOU that comes to comes to maturity and um, they need to uh, uh, pay the money back and redeem the IOU they what they do is they just print another IOU and say well here's another five for your to redeem my five billion pound IOU I'll give you another five billion pound IOU and uh, but the trouble is that the the IOU they're redeeming they were probably paying 1% or 2% on, and the, and the IOU that they're selling now, they're faced with having to pay 5 or 6% on it. So, government borrowing uh, costs are the, are the second biggest in, uh, expense of government. They literally are, when you pay your taxes, what, you, what they use your taxes to pay, the second biggest item is just interest on the money that they've already created and spent. Now, you get a problem where you get into a sort of a debt spiral and you have to borrow more money to pay the interest on the money you've already borrowed. And it's a, it's a problem that's familiar to most people and most households. It's not difficult, you know, to understand. And uh, so the, the government's in a sort of a debt spiral at the moment and as we've discussed in the past there's there's two or three ways you can get out of a debt spiral you can just tell your creditors you're not going to pay so for example you know you can go to the national health service and the armed forces and say sorry guys uh, you know we're not going to pay your wages for a year because that's roughly what we owe uh, obviously that's not doable um, Hello, flash of blue light coming the other way. One day I'll be in one of them. Or you can um, you can say, look, uh, you know, I know I've got, let's say, I've got thirty thousand pound outstanding on my credit card. So my my solution is, <coughs> I'm going to get rich. I'm going to be a millionaire. And when I'm a millionaire, assuming I don't borrow any more money in the meantime, that 30,000 is going to be peanuts. I'll be able to pay that back easy. And that's the growth strategy. That's the, you know, we're going to grow our way out of the debt, which is the uh, way that the government is framing it at the moment. That's the Liz Trust way and the Quasi Kwarteng way. And uh, the third way, which is the only way, really, that is practical, which is to keep printing and accept that your money is going to uh, hyperinflate. <coughs> Excuse me. I mean, not technically hyperinflate, because hyperinflation is a rate of inflation that's well in excess of uh, whatever we're going to see in this country. But I mean, by, you know, but. 20% uh, most people in this country will call 20% hyperinflation and so what you do is you need a nice reasonably long oh hello another ambulance a reasonably long period of, uh, of very high inflation and you shouldn't fight that you know because if you raise interest rates to try and uh, get inflation down then you do two things first of all you cripple yourself with the debt spiral because your debts get unaffordable. But as I say, you can always print more money to um, to pay them. But you become a basket case like Venezuela or, you know, the British pound becomes a laughing stock, the peso of the of the world. Or, um, but soon enough, what happens is all your debt becomes really cheap because it basically the pound's not worth anything. And so that, uh, trillion 
pounds worth of debt that you've got, which the government has got, he uh, won't buy a cheese sandwich, as I'm very happy to keep repeating. And then happy days, you know, everybody's uh, savings have been lost and uh, everybody's pensions worth but not, uh, but the government's uh, still printing merrily and the uh, 10 pound note's been replaced by a 100 pound note. And this is very familiar to, <coughs> excuse me, anyone who's uh, knows, you know, knows the history of uh, hyperinflating currencies. This is a well-trodden path, you know, unfortunately well-trodden by uh, most uh, emerging economies and second world tin pot dictatorships and stuff like that. So the world is getting very upset about uh, the uh, trust quarting budget because they've uh, decided to cancel an increase in um, national insurance. They've decided to cut income tax next year. They've decided to abolish the 45% top rate of tax for high earners. And um, in addition, they uh, have announced a, a raft of uh, government spending, which includes telling people that they're going to pay half their energy bills for the next uh, six months or so, which is, you know, uh, domestic and commercial alike, which is a massive giveaway, you know, which comes on the back of the furlough payments giveaway and uh, all the other giveaways and so they're doing um, everyone's having a uh, heart attack because they've done the two things which you really can't do they've they've cut taxes and put up government spending and as Peter Schiff is very fond of saying that you can't cut tax without cutting the size of government government is funded by tax they don't have any money they don't um, <coughs> they don't uh, have any money of their own they don't create any money they don't have an income only what they get from tax and so you can't really cut tax and put up government spending because there's a gap in the middle there already is a gap in the middle and what fills that gap money printing so it's a bit like someone with a, you know, who's got thirty thousand pounds on the credit card, and says, uh, Let, "So what if we have thirty-three? If I have thirty-three, thirty, schmerty, it doesn't make any difference. So what's the difference? I'm still in, I'm still in the clock. Whether I'm thirty-three or thirty overdue, it doesn't really make much difference, you know. And it really just depends on whether the credit card issuer will lend you the money." And in this case, the credit card issuer is the uh, Bank of England that cashes the IOUs. And they've already, you know, the Bank of England really should not be monetizing government debt like this. It is specifically regarded as a bad thing and was understood to be a bad thing. And they shouldn't have started doing it in the first place. But as soon as they started doing it, you know, they had a very weak argument against carrying on doing it. So, good man. Strim, strim. So, you know, so now what's the Bank of England then is, is, is going to the Treasurer and saying, look guys, we've got to put interest rates up because inflation's out of control. And the government says, look, <clears throat> you know, payments on the debt that we borrowed off of you, by the way, are crippling us. And if you put the interest rate up from 2% to 6%, it's going to kill us. We'll just have to print money hand over. We'll become a zombie government in the same way as these com companies, or zombie companies that have to borrow to pay the interest on the money that they've already borrowed. You know, not making any profit other than what they can borrow. And um, not only are you going to uh, bankrupt the country, but we want inflation. We want, that's how we're going to write the debt down. We can't afford to not pay. <coughs> oh, I'm not coming down or something. We can't afford to not pay. Um, you know, although the story for the public is we're going to outgrow, 
everybody. Nobody believes that because historically we've never grown and uh, and anyway we've only got 18 months for the next election so it's going to be you know really touch and go whether or not we'll see any signs of growth before the next election even if assuming that the strategy is successful and it's certainly not going to happen in the four days that uh, has, has elapsed since the last budget and it's certainly not going to um, happen before you know George Soros and all these guys short the short the um, the pound short the hell out of the pound. So I think it's just this this idea that uh, they're going to decrease taxes and increase government spending simultaneously that has, has shocked everybody because there was this illusion you know there's this faith in the system that somehow they someone cleverer than you has got an idea about how this is all going to come right in the end. And everybody's going to live happily ever after. And uh, Kwarteng, I think, as an inexperienced chancellor, you know, giving a what was effectively a mini budget without uh, any sort of office of um, budgetary responsibility report on whether or not it's you know at all believable or just a you know Jack and Ori type story. Um, he just doesn't. He hasn't imbued. He hasn't built up any credibility to do that sort of budget. And um, he's promised to explain how he's going to do it on November the 23rd. And I think the BBC will broadcast that on Jack and Ori because <coughs> I'm sure they'll bring it back for an extra special. Perhaps they'll have King Charles reading it. Because I'd love to know how you can... I'd love to know how you can increase government spending and decrease tax revenue with a, and, uh, and fill in the gap somehow. And how he's going to fill in the gap is, you know, is by printing money, which has caused the problem. And you've got, at the moment, you've literally got the Bank of England that wants to reduce the money supply. And so he's now rolling off these rolling over these bonds he's not buying anymore he's just cashing in the ones they've got reducing their balance sheet and um, pushing up interest rates to try and uh, stop the pound falling and on the other side you've got a treasury saying uh, we, we want you we want you to juice the economy we want you to keep interest rates low because uh, it's very unpopular with the voters. You know, all their mortgages are going up. Their food's gone up 10% this year. Uh, so for the first time, you know, the Bank of England, funnily enough, is doing the right thing and is sort of standing up to the government <clears throat> who are, who is like, which is like a junkie and saying, you know, I need my heroin. And the Bank of England is saying, sorry, uh, <laughs> you're gonna have to go through a period of withdrawal. <laughs> which is, you know, I feel sorry for Liz Truss and Quasi Quarting because, but only because they are the ones left standing when this game of musical chairs has stopped. And it was always going to stop. I mean, you know, someone was going to be in charge when it stopped. And it looks like it may have just stopped. And uh, the, you know, a lot of people were wise before the event, myself included, go back through my podcast to see that I've been talking about this debt spiral for a long time but the thing is that um, you can never say is when it's going to happen you can know what's going to happen but you can't ever know what day it's going to happen and uh, you know sometimes these things can go on far longer than you think you know they there's a saying in America don't fight the Fed and there's a saying you know should be a saying in the UK don't fight the Bank of England they can print the money far longer than you can criticise them for being irresponsible but um, there's a big backlash against everybody that's shorting the pound at the moment which is entirely predictable you know and then uh, the Treasury blamed uh, George Soros didn't they for shorting the pound when it fell out of the exchange rate mechanism on Black Friday and um, you know which is stupid it's like uh, it's like not you know failing to maintain your uh, 
your woodshed and then realising it's got a woodworm and then blaming the woodworm for the fact that you haven't creosoted the shed. That's their job, you know. They're scorpions. That is the nature of what they do. And uh, they make a lot of money when they predict that things are going to go down. And uh, they lose a load of money when the things that they predicted will go down go up instead. So that as long as they're risking their own money, I don't care. The only problem with shorting is that uh, sometimes it's capable of, uh, you know, sometimes you can make these things happen. Ooh. Hello, hello, hello. Right, that's my first patient. Gotta go, nice to see you, bye.